as we return back to our seats today, we will be going into our time to hear and respond to a message from God's Word. And I invite you all... Check. I invite you all to turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 61. And as we return to our seats today and do just that, turn to Isaiah 61, I have another confession to make this Sunday yet again. As I was reading over the passage provided by the Christian Women's Connection, which once again is our national women's ministry that we have in the Church of God, international women's ministry we have as a, it's a worldwide organization and network of women who have come together to serve the Lord and something they provide each and every year are those beautiful Advent readings we have as we light the candles. They also provide us passages to help unify our whole movement during this season around the similar text. And I was, I was looking at this passage, I was like, this is just almost as just weird as the last one. You know, just like last week, I'm like, what are you saying here, God? Because I know you were saying something last week, and you had a very powerful message for us, and I know you have a powerful message for us this week. But I kept looking at it, and I'm like, what does love have anything to do with this text? And you'll see what I'm saying, because this text is more about something known as peace. And we don't light the candle of peace until the fourth Sunday of Advent. But this text is all about peace and harmony. And it was through wrestling with this text throughout the week and really just asking God that he spoke. And he showed me exactly what love has to do with this. And so with that being said, I would invite us to read Isaiah 61, 1 through 10. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the, opening of the prison to all those who are bound. I have to apologize. It's still a great passage, but it's not the right passage. <laughs> I have Isaiah 11 written down. It's an Isaiah passage. Yes, Isaiah 11. I just really wanted to go to Isaiah 61. <laughs> It worked out fine. We're going to go to Isaiah 11. It will not be on your screen, so I do encourage you to scroll there on your phones or to turn there in your Bible. Give everybody a second. So, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist. Faithfulness, the belt of his lions. The wolf shall lie, shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow shall, and, and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the otter's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a single for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. You know, when I read this, I have to ask, what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with any of this? And I've already promised I would not sing. 
So it's just like how Tina Turner asked back in the 80s. What does love have to do with any of this? This is all about peace. It's all about harmony. This shoot of Jesse, it's important to understand what this shoot of Jesse is from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. David, who is promised, would always have a, 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 a descendant upon the throne in Jerusalem. This shoot from the stump. And we got to understand a stump. What does it mean if there's a stump and no tree? It, exactly, Josie. It's been cut down. The tree's gone. The tree got cut down. The tree is dead and gone. But a shoot's going to come out. A shoot's going to come out of the stump of Jesse, who is the father of David, who once again was promised that there would always be a king of his lineage on the throne in Jerusalem. This shoot that it speaks of here in Isaiah is Jesus. Jesus, who is a descendant of David. And so what Isaiah is talking about here is the coming of Jesus and that there's going to be this new life that bursts forth from this dead stump. That there's going to be new life that comes forth. And all these wonderful things he talks about here in Isaiah 11, not Isaiah 61, all these wonderful things are going to come about. They're going to take place because of the shoot that comes from the stump of Jesse. This new life that is birthed forth out of death. And isn't that Jesus in a nutshell? Jesus, a bringer of hope. Jesus, a bringer of love. Jesus, a bringer of joy. Jesus, a bringer of peace. It's exactly what he brings. And I read this text and I see harmony in creation. When, especially when it talks about how the, 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 the lion and the lamb will be together. That the child will be able to stick their hand in an otter's nest. Who wants to do that? Who wants to walk over a cobra's den? Don't sign me up for that. Not at all. Even if there's harmony in all creation, I don't want to deal with that. The point is, this text is all about peace and harmony. Well, that's the fourth Sunday of Advent. This Sunday is about love. What are you trying to do here, God? What are you trying to show us here, God? These were questions I was just wrestling with as I kept pouring and pouring over this text. And as I said, like that classic song of Tina Turner, I kept asking, what's love got to do with it? And like a Batman slapping Robin mean, it hit me. And in fact, I got one of those. I got one of those. What's love got to do with it? It has everything to do with it. It is the core virtue of it all. Love has everything to do with it. Jesus' coming is centered on love. It is the center of his coming. It is the very reason of his coming. In fact, there would be no coming of Jesus had there been no love. In fact, that famed verse, John 3.16, says it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's all for love. Without love, there is no hope. Without love, there is no joy. Without love, there is no peace. Without love, there is no Jesus. But it's because of love he brought us hope. It's because of love he brought us joy. It is because of love that he brought us peace. It is all because of love we can read passages like this prophecy that Isaiah gives of this coming day of perfect harmony. And I want to talk about that coming day of perfect harmony just for a second here. This coming day of perfect harmony in all of creation is the way that God intended for creation to be. Because when God created the heavens and the earth, you know what never even existed? Death. Death wasn't even a thought when God created the heavens and the earth, when he created all of creation. Death wasn't even part of it. Rather, it was the aftermath and result of our sin. It was the aftermath and the result of us saying, you know what, God, I think we can do this better. No, you know what, God, I know we can do this better. And we took of that tree. And it wasn't necessarily the fruit of the tree, but what that fruit symbolized. Us wanting to claim autonomy. 
to become gods ourselves, to be able to determine what is good and evil ourselves. And because of that, creation fractured. Death became a reality because of our sin. Pain and suffering in this life became a reality because of our sin. And where there once was flourishing in life, there was only death and decay. Hope was gone. Peace was gone. Joy was gone. The harmony in all of creation was gone. But then God, in His great love for us, sent Jesus to us through love, by love, and only in love so that we could once again reclaim that hope. We could reclaim that joy. We could reclaim peace. But it's all because of love. Because without love, those things are impossible. Without love, what we read in Isaiah would never happen. That there would be harmony. You know, I think about what love is. And we really don't need another sermon about what love is, to be honest. We have all the information in the world about what love is. We have this right here. We have stores dedicated to selling this, God's word. And it tells us exactly what love is. You know the problem with our generation, this day and age, our culture, and every culture that's existed before this? It's not because of a lack of knowledge. It's not due to a lack of knowledge of what love is. It's due to a lack of application. It's due to a fear of actually paying the cost and what it might mean if we would truly walk in love towards God, love towards ourselves so that we can walk in love towards others. Because that comes at a high cost. Think about the cost Jesus paid for love. He died on the cross. But if we really need to know what love is, Paul gives us the perfect description. And Carson, I'm sorry this isn't on the slides. I'm going ad lib at this point. So, <laughs> It's in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Patient, kind. Have you ever not wanted to be patient with someone? Have you ever not wanted to be kind to that person who cut you off in traffic? To that person who runs you down in the shopping cart because they're trying to get to something before you do? Have you ever just wanted to just get back at someone for something they did to you? You wanted to get your retribution. You believed you deserved retribution for what they did, and you would do whatever it took to get that. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Paul's showing us exactly what love is. And it's not what love is that challenges us. It's the cost of living in this kind of love that challenges us. The difficulty it is to truly live this out but you know what? When Jesus came in love, he didn't come just to teach us knowledge about love. He came to transform us in love. He came to transform us and change us so that we would be ready for that beautiful, wonderful, glorious day of his second coming. We would be ready for that day that Isaiah prophesies about where all creation will once again be in harmony all of creation will once again be at peace and that we can have hope in that peace that is coming. We can have joy in that peace that is coming because He first loved us. That He still came for us in love so that we could have these things, that we could partake of these things. And here's the good news. It's not just a day in the future that we have to wait for to experience these things. We can experience them right here and right now if we would learn to walk in obedience to Jesus' command 
of love. We could experience the hope, the joy, the peace that Jesus brings if we can learn to experience and walk in the love. Because it's not just about receiving love that Jesus came for. He wanted us to go forth and show love. Because for there to be harmony here on earth as it is in heaven now, it requires something. For there to be hope, joy, and peace, it requires love. For there is no peace and harmony here on earth as it is in heaven without God's people stepping up in love for the other, just like Jesus stepped up in love for us. And we've been given the first fruits, as Paul would say in Romans 8.23, he says this, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This idea of first fruits is an amazing illustration of like what a foretaste is. You ever go to Cold Stone? I love going to Cold Stone Creamery. Just love it. Or even Rhymers. Oh gosh, I love Rhymers. And how many ice cream flavors do you taste before you actually select one? You get all these little foretastes, all these, 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 these first fruits of the ice cream first, and you get to, you get to taste it all. And it's so delicious and so wonderful that you fill up on just samples, and you can't eat your ice cream. But the point is, Jesus is giving us those samples. He's showing us those samples. He's showing us how he lived in those samples and giving them us to show others. He's given us the foretaste because love has come and love has won. And it doesn't, this idea that, not idea, this prophecy that Isaiah prophesies about in the future of the day of his second coming isn't something we have to wait for. It's something we can live in right here and right now. And it all depends on how we choose to love. Will we choose to love? Will we choose to pay the cost that it takes? To give up our wants and desires for the sake of the other. To love others as we love ourselves. To love God fully and to walk in obedience fully to God, even if that means that we would have to change the way we live. Because Jesus isn't just coming to transfer knowledge. He's not just coming to transfer information. He's coming to bring about transformation. He came and brought transformation. And the question for us today is, do we want to live in this transformation? So many times Jesus speaks about this. There was a really popular thing that was going around the internet and social media about 10 years ago. It was about fear. Do not fear. It said that, you know, the Bible says do not fear or something like fear not over 365 times. And there's a, there's a verse every day of the year that talks about you shall not fear, do not fear, fear not. And it was this thing that was really popular. And I want to play a little bit of the game. How many times did you think the Bible says love in it? To love. Do you think it's more or less? Those who think it's more, raise your hand. More? Okay. What about less? Who thinks it's less? Anybody? The answer may surprise you. Okay, I got one less. It's more. Sorry, I tricked you. I'm sorry, Andrew. It's way more. In fact, the Bible mentions love over 551 times, depending upon the translation you use. Because some translations will translate the Greek and Hebrew words for love as different in English. They'll, they'll translate it as a synonym of love, but it's still love. And in fact, there are many Greek and Hebrew words for love, and it's actually kind of a funny thing because their language was so versatile to explain various degrees of love that you have for something or someone. We just say, I love tacos, but I also love my wife. And the question is, do I love my wife more than tacos? I'll get back to you on that one. Of course I do. But the point is, we only have one word. They had multiple words with deep meanings behind those words. And we just translate them as love. Some translations will translate the word love as charity. Some translations will tr change the word love to sympathy even. It looks at these, these different synonyms, and they're trying to draw out the deeper meaning that that word in Greek or Hebrew actually meant. But the core of it is love. The Bible speaks more about love than it speaks about the other virtues. 
all the other virtues. In fact, these words combined compose of over two in the top 200 list of words, which includes the, to, be, a. You know, so all these, these little words that we just use in sentence structure. Love is in the top 200 words used in the Bible. If you pull out a concordance, you'll see this. For those who don't know what a concordance is, in the days before Google, in the days before Bible Gateway, we had these thick books. I still have like four of them on my bookshelf in my office. Big books that have all the words that are, are most used in the Bible. The section on love is always the thickest. The point being that love is at the center of everything. God is love, the Bible says. It plainly says that. God is love. And why is it that Jesus comes? It's out of love. And if we have no love, we'll never have peace. We'll never experience this harmony. We'll never have the joy that this kind of harmony here on earth as it is in heaven can bring. We'll find no hope for the future because things like harmony and peace without love is a pipe dream. It's an absolute pipe dream. And the thing is, we can live in this hope now. We can live in this peace and joy now. We can live in love now. Because Jesus has come. Love has come and love has won. But we have to choose to live in it. Which was the center of Jesus' message. In fact, whenever there was a lawyer in Luke 10 that talked, you know, talks about this greatest commandment, Jesus doesn't say the greatest commandment. It's a lawyer, a teacher of the law who comes up to him. If we turn to Luke chapter 10, we're going to be going to verses 25 through 37. And it's a really interesting time because, you know, Jesus is just transitioning from his previous location to the next. And he then is brought into this moment of great teaching. It's actually a parable known as the Good Samaritan. But it's not the parable as much that I want us to focus in on right now. We will focus in on that parable. But it's the context, the what happens before and what happens after, which shows us the deeper meaning of this parable. In terms of what happens before, it says, And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? I love how Jesus responds to this. The lawyer is putting him to the test. The lawyer is trying to trap trap Jesus here. The lawyer is trying to get Jesus off guard so he can say, Aha, you really don't know what you're talking about. And what is it that Jesus does? As a master teacher, he turns the question on him with another question. How do you read the law? What do you think? He turns this illegitimate question into a legitimate one by asking another question, by digging deeper. What is it about that? What is it about that that you would ask that question? You know, why don't you tell me what you think? And more importantly, through this questioning, you know what Jesus is doing? He's helping lead this lawyer to a self-discovery, a shared discovery with Jesus. He doesn't just give the answer. And in fact, if you read the Bible, nine times out of ten, when people ask Jesus questions, what does he do? He asks a question in response. Because he wants to help people discover fully themselves what the answer is. Because when you can discover it for yourself, it will have a deeper meaning and significance and a deeper impact on your lives. He could have just sat there and transferred the information all he wanted. But he's not looking for just a simple transfer of information. He's looking for transformation. And we're going to see that here as it continues. Verse 27, the lawyer answers, and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself which was something that Jesus would have said earlier in his life and ministry, were the two greatest commandments, that all the law and the prophets would hang on these two commands. All the law and the prophets. Not some, but all of it. Something that Paul would later proclaim and and summarize for us in, in Romans, where he actually would say that love is the fulfillment of the law. Which is just fascinating. Love, the fulfillment The lawyer gets the right answer. He aptly answers Jesus' question. 
And Jesus even says, you have answered correctly. Do this. Don't mistake the command here. The command in Jesus' questioning. Do this and you will live. But desiring to justify himself, it says in verse 29, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I expected this lawyer saying this question, knowing that there's people around him that acted like him, that believed like him, that thought like him. There are a bunch of people around here. And so he knew that Jesus was going to just point, like, you know, love that guy. Love that guy. Love the, your fellow Jew. Love the people that act like you, that believe like you, that do like you. But you know what Jesus actually said about that? To love those you like, what reward is there in that? I say to you, love your enemy. That's what he says, to love our enemy, to love the people that are different. This is a great question, though. Who is my neighbor? And this is where we get into the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is where we see Jesus just rock this lawyer's world. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And I want to stop there for a second. Keep the slide up. You know, by chance, a priest, oh, the next, verse 31, a priest was coming down the road. Now, there's probably priests among them. I guarantee the lawyer had priests with him. And, you know, those priests are going, yeah, a priest came down the road. Fix the problem, right? All of it's fixed. But what is it Jesus says? And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And we can't be mistaken here. Let's say if the man's there, ooh. I hope someone takes care of that. I really, Dude, did you see that guy lying in the street over there? Someone should go take care of that. When it was the priest's duty, it was the priest's responsibility. Not only were the priests the caretakers of spiritual matters, they were also the caretakers of truth and justice. They were to be there to help the meek, the poor. They were to be there to be a lending aid, to be a vessel of God's blessing to the people. The priest ignores him. And I guarantee you there are some priests there going, Oof, that was me just yesterday. I did that. You know, if Jesus was teaching this today, he would say, you know, and a pastor walked by the other way. Jesus continues in verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, and if there were priests, there were Levites amongst them that day. The Levites going, yeah, we got it right, didn't we? We got it right. When he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now, you may be asking, what's the difference between a Levite and priest? If you know your word pretty well, you know that the Levites were the priests. But here's the thing. Not all Levites were priests, but all priests were Levites. The tribe of Levite was granted the inheritance through the law of Moses to be the priest of the people of Israel. But though every priest was a Levite, not every Levite was a priest. They would serve in different capacities. They would serve in the temple. They would serve in the communities to help and assist the priest. But just because they were a Levite didn't mean they were a priest. But they were the next best thing to a priest in this day and age. They were still holy. They were still considered set apart for the service of the Lord and His sanctuary. Even though a Levite might not be a priest, they were still expected to be a pillar of justice. They were still expected to be there for the hopeless and the meek. And here the Levite comes and passes by. You know, Jesus today could say, Then there was a self-proclaimed follower of me, who likewise also turned a blind eye, because even though every legitimate pastor, I pray to God, was a follower of Jesus, but not every follower of Jesus is a pastor. And that's okay. We're all called to different roles and services inside God's community, inside God's church. But the message here cannot be mistaken. The person that acted like the person, the person that looked like him, believed like him, the person that was lying in the street, they all turned a blind eye and walked the other way. They didn't show love. And his point just gets all the more pungent in verse 33. But a Samaritan as he journeyed, came to where he was. Now, we can't mistake the division between the Jews and Samaritans. I'm sure all of them are going, <laughs> the Samaritan probably kicked him while he was down. Samaritan didn't do any better than the others. I can see him saying that laughing. 
But as we continue on, we see, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Then it continues. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii. He made a personal sacrifice that shows He gave more money to the innkeeper and saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And the thing is, the Samaritan wasn't a good Jew. They were a terrible, they weren't even a Jew at all to the Jewish people. The Samaritans were apostate because they didn't worship God the way that they worshiped. They worshiped God in a completely whole different way. The same God, but they they just had differences between them and the place of worship, how you should worship. The Samaritans did their own thing, and the Jews continued to do the thing the law of Moses prescribed. And so the Jews would be like, well, we're the good ones. They're They're not even one. They're not even a worshiper of God. They're not even part of the family of God. And they were completely divided. They didn't even associate with one another. They were so divided. And here comes the different Samaritan who has compassion, shows love and mercy, where the priest, the Levite, the ones who should have showed the love and mercy and grace turned a blind eye. This is almost be as if Jesus would say today, and then came along the atheist, the one who had no belief in Jesus, but he showed mercy, he showed grace, he showed compassion, he sacrificed of his own self, his own worth, his finances to help this man. He sacrificed. And this is where Jesus asked the next question. He said, he said, um, I'm sorry, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? I'm sure the lawyer in a solemn voice said the one who showed him mercy. And that's what it says in verse 37. The lawyer knows the answer. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Which is the correct answer. Bingo! He gets it. Fantastic, right? Jesus is done. He taught everything he needed to teach about love. He taught everything he needed to teach about who is your neighbor to this lawyer. The lawyer gets it, right? Jesus isn't looking for a simple transfer of knowledge here, though. He's looking for action. He's looking for transformation, which is why in verse 37, as we continue, it says, and Jesus said to him, you go. And do likewise. You go and do likewise. Because once again, it's not just about the head knowledge, it's about the obedience. Do we walk in the obedience to the command of love that Jesus gives us? Do we walk in that obedience? And live a life of love. Not just knowing what love is. Not just knowing about Jesus. But living for Jesus. Each and every year. Each and every Advent season. We light a candle of love. To remind ourselves of the love that God first showed us. That yet while we were sinners. He died for us. That he came out of love. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only son. It was through love. But if we never take that knowledge of love. You know, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy or boast. If we never take that knowledge that God's given us about love and apply it into our lives, what good is it? What good, what worth is it? For we will never experience the hope of that coming day Isaiah prophesied about. If we don't go and do the same, what's love got to do with it? It has everything to do with it. It all depends upon it. Because it was all for love. Jesus came to show us great love so that we could in turn show others. He came to show us great love so that we could have a hope. A hope for a coming day in the future of peace and harmony in all creation that should bring us joy. It's interesting that love is the second candle. Because it all hinges upon that. The love of God. And he comes to bring us love so that we can bring others love. How is it that God is calling you today to go and do the same? 
This is a season for love. This is a season to show compassion and mercy on, on the least of these. Who is it in your life that God is saying, go and love them, show them love, call them, give them an encouraging word today. Call them and give them an encouraging word. Let them know that they are loved. Lift them up. Pray for them. Who do you know that's struggling to barely make ends meet? They don't even have a pantry with a box of anything in it. Go get them some groceries. Show them some love. Show them some compassion. Show them some mercy. What about all those people who have to work during the holidays? Those who have to work on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. They don't have a choice. They're stuck. You know, I think about our community's first responders. How can you show them love? Maybe by bringing them a meal to show them that they are cared for, that they are loved, they are appreciated. Maybe on December 5th or December 19th. You never know. Those are some good dates I hear. To do just this, to show love, to walk in love. Maybe it's your neighbor who's having an issue with something in their yard that you know that you could help them take care of. And you could go over there and show them the love by raking their leaves, by tending to their yard, or helping them with something that they have a need in. Something as simple as donating socks to a homeless shelter. Let me tell you, socks are in high demand. Clean, new, dry socks are in high demand at any homeless shelter in this nation. Maybe it's just starting a sock drive and showing love that way. Maybe it's about collecting diapers for a pregnancy center. They need diapers, trust me. And giving a young woman who's scared and pregnant hope, showing her that she's not alone, that she can do this, and that we, the church, will come alongside her in it. There are so many ways, simple ways. It doesn't have to be this elaborate scheme or plan. To show love. And speaking of that, I think about this last Thursday where Amy Marilis came up to me and said, why aren't we doing anything for the open house? I want to do something to share the love of Jesus during the open house. And she's like, could we serve hot chocolate? And you better believe just by the simple act of serving hot chocolate, the love of Jesus was shared with our community. Something that we're going to be doing each Thursday during the open house. And God made that way. God inspired that dream. What visions and dreams of sharing love do you have? It doesn't have to be grand or big. It can be something as simple as hot chocolate. Collecting socks. Donating some diapers. It doesn't even have to cost you money. It could be raking leaves. Whatever it is, how is Jesus calling you today? Just like he called that lawyer to go and do the same. The problem isn't a lack of knowledge. We have all we need about knowledge when it comes to love. The problem is the willingness to pay the cost and an increasing willingness to actually live it, to do it, to live as Jesus has called us to live, the way that he showed us we should live. He wasn't just about transferring knowledge. He was wanting to transfer transformation to us so that we would be more like him. And it's through doing this, through showing love, that we truly live out our theme verse for this Advent. Hebrews 13, 1 through 2. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So finally, and I say finally, in conclusion, I know I've gone a little bit long today, but it was necessary, because we have to get this, church. We have to get this. Let us stop passing by on the other side. Let us stop hoping someone else will come and save the day. Let us stop relying on government programs to save people. Rather, let us stand up. Let us rise up as his church and be who it is Jesus has called us to be, his hands and feet here on earth as he is in heaven, to be a vessel of which God's kingdom will break through. Because the more we pass by on the other side, the more we, we, we pass off our responsibility to other non-for-profits and other people, the more we miss out on the blessing. On the blessing there is 
to be a light of love that brings hope for a future day of peace that we will have and to give joy in that. Without love, though, we have none of that. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever.